Cricket is a sport that brings with it passion. And he's hit him. And energy. Well, oh, reverse. Reverse! Oh, oh, the series! Don't worry about that! Drama. Celebrations. And many, many heartbreaks. Few fans know heartbreak better than the South Africans. That's right, today we'll talk about the South Africa cricket team, a team that are always favorites to win whatever tournament they're competing in. But somehow have just one international trophy to their name. It's not just that, they will also get so, so close, but choke when it matters the most. South Africa outdone, didn't run. I cannot believe it. How close, you ask? To find that out, we need to take a deep dive into the entire history of the unluckiest nation in cricketing history. Up until the 18th century, South Africa was colonized by the Dutch and the East Europeans did not share the love for cricket that the English had. When the Englishmen arrived in 1795, they brought with them the beautiful game of cricket and it immediately took off. The sport was incredibly popular and it grew rapidly. By 1808, the first ever recorded match was being played in Captain. This makes them one of the oldest homes for cricket in the world. In 1889, they became only the third nation in history to play a test match. Owen Robert Dunnell, a former footballer who played in the FA Cup final, captained South Africa against England. Unsurprisingly, they were thoroughly beaten. The same year, they played another match and lost again. These matches are unfortunately not considered official tests. However, as the Imperial Cricket Conference was only formed in 1906 and South Africa was a founding member of this governing body. The Proteus really struggled against England and Australia in their days. Their lowest point was definitely the English tour of 1895-96, to when legends Tom Hayward, George Lohman, Sammy Woods, and C.B. Fry absolutely humiliated the South African team by defeating them in all three tests. Things wouldn't stay this way forever, however. South Africa's team really started to improve in their early 1900s as the team welcomed a few legends of their own. The squad had no shortage of talent in any position. They had amazing batsmen in Jimmy Sinclair, Dave Norse, Lewis Tancred, and Percy Sherwell. Their bowling was feared worldwide with googly specialist Reggie Schwartz teaching teammates Brett Bulger, Aubrey Faulkner, and Gordon White the trick to bowling a perfect googly. He was greatly successful as this quartet, along with Bonner Middleton, formed the world's very first spin attack and the other teams just did not have an answer for it. They also had no answer for the incredible all-rounders the team kept producing. All three of Schwartz's students were all-rounders. Alongside them, Tips Nook and Charlie Lewin also delivered with both ball and bat. Lewin and Faulkner were the most well-known among them, with Faulkner often being referred to as the greatest all-rounder to play the game before World War I. A few years down the line, the super team was further strengthened by one of the greatest batsmen of this time, Herbie Taylor, and exciting pace bowler, Sid Pegler. South Africa was now a force to be reckoned with. Sadly, around this time, the First World War had started and soon after that, the Second World War took place. This meant that not a lot of cricket was played around this time, as South Africa was heavily affected by both wars, and international matches were suspended around this time. But that doesn't mean that this era didn't have its fair share of legends. Herbie Taylor cemented himself as an icon for the team. This era also featured many more batting legends for South Africa, such as Dudley Norse, Bruce Mitchell, Peter Vanderbilt, Eric Rowan, and Alan Melville. Another notable mention is Jen Belisakis, an all-rounder who is widely regarded as the best Greek origin player ever. After the wars, the team would play against England, Australia, and New Zealand on a regular basis. This was all about to change. 1948 started a dark chapter in the history of South Africa, the apartheid. Apartheid in South Africa crumbled after Nelson Mandela walked to freedom. Laws made white people officially superior, and the large black majority faced discrimination in every aspect of their lives. The white popularity took all power in the country and heavily discriminated against other nations. This made its way into cricket as well, as no non-white players were allowed to play for South Africa at this time. The world could not stand by and watch this injustice unfold, and so the anti-apartheid movement started. This led ICC to issue a complete ban on the nation in 1970, five years before the first ever World Cup. As a result, many phenomenal South African players could not create the legacy they deserved. The biggest among them is none other than Graham Pollock. 
arguably the greatest South African batsman of all time. Legendary Australian Don Bradman actually described Pollock, along with West Indies Sir Garfield Sobers, as the best left-handed batsman he'd ever seen. There are so many others who missed their chance to show the world their talent as a result of this ban. Classy batsman Barry Richards and bowling prodigy Mike Proctor also had their careers cut short by this decision. Oh, and that must be close. Yes, that one looked... Pacer Vincent Vanderbilt never even got to play for his national side. Oh, that's a good ball. He didn't get a touch. The political situation of the country improved greatly in by the 1990s, and so in 1991, South Africa was reinstated as a test nation. This was a joyous time for South Africans, as after 20 long years, they could finally see their national team in action, and the best part was there would be no racial discrimination in squad selection. It wasn't an easy return for the Proteus, as South Africa would soon face the biggest challenge in their cricketing history, the 1992 Cricket World Cup. Needless to say, they joined the World Cup with a very inexperienced squad. Even the captain, Kepler Wessels, only played three matches prior to the tournament. Other notable members of the squad were future captain, Hansi Kronj, bowling legend, Alan Donald, and fielding icon, Jaunty Rose. Jaunty, and he's hit him. So, how did this young and experienced side perform at the World Cup? Well, much to everyone's surprise, they were amazing. They finished third in the table ahead of eventual winners Pakistan and made it to the semi-finals. They could not defeat three-time runner-up England in the semis to reach the finals. A particular standout was Jaunty Rhodes, whose freak run-out of Inzimam al Haq is still one of the most talked-about moments of that tournament. In the next four years, the team improved massively, welcoming many new superstars. Jacques Calis, the young all-rounder, had everything the team needed. Sean Pollock, a bowling all-rounder, formed a legendary partnership with Alan Donald. Gary Kirsten, a sensible batsman who knew how to control the tempo of the game, also joined the camp. Captaincy had also gone over to Cronge by this point. Perhaps what was most interesting about these additions is that most of them were great fielders. The fielding coaches were clearly doing something right as the team constantly produced expert fielders. The 1996 World Cup started off really well. The team won all their group matches thanks to some batting magic from Cronch and Kirsten. Not to mention, the team's brilliant fielding meant that most opponents struggled to set high targets against them. The key word there was most. West Indies was not like most teams. Well, the West Indies won the toss and decided to bat. Let's now go to the National Stadium in Karachi and join Chander Paul and Courtney Brown at the crease. The Windies ruined South Africa's excellent fielding record with Laura's explosive shots that, quite frankly, were impossible to stop. Laura scored 111 on the day. And he's made it, and that's a most magnificent 100 by Laura. West Indies boasted a total of 264. 264 for eight in their 50 overs. South Africa gave an admirable chance with 245 runs on the board, but it was no use as the Proteus had to head back home. In the short two-year gap between this World Cup and the 1998 Champions Trophy, South Africa found themselves another massive talent, Mark Bosher. He's among the greatest wicketkeeper batsmen of all time with stylish batting and super fast reflexes. He quickly settled into the South African side like a puzzle fitting right into place. The 1998 Champions Trophy, at the time known as the ICC Knockout Trophy, was the first ever edition of the tournament. As the name suggested, this tournament did not have a group stage or anything of the sort. It was a simple bracket-style tournament among the test-playing nations. No one really knew what to expect. What followed was a thrilling affair that South Africa fans are sure to never forget. There was trouble from stage one for South Africa as England set a massive target of 281. Uh, 281 for seven. English captain Adam Holyoke led from the front and scored 83 runs off just 91 balls. Boys hit that one. The Proteus had to give a strong reply and opener Daryl Cullinan did just that. His 69 runs early on in the game ensured the middle order had a strong base to win off of, and they did just that. South Africa won by six wickets. In the semi-finals, South Africa went up against Sri Lanka, and unfortunately for both sides, it was a rainy day. DLS reduced the overcount to just 39. The Lankans could do little on this day as Kalis was on fire, scoring 113 runs off just 100 balls. Well played. A quick and very thorough solid century from John Callis. He led his team to a total of 240. 240 for seven. Sri Lanka lost the match by 92 runs as a result of South Africa's excellent bowling. 
South Africa have won the game and they are through to the final. The moment had finally arrived. South Africa were in their first final. Side for too long, it's exactly the same side. They faced the mighty West Indies once again and this time they came out victorious. Oh, big appeal for LBW. First ball, this is unbelievable. Even though the Windy set a decent target of 245. Chalice, an excellent spell, five wickets for him. Trony. Limited by Kali's five wicket haul. Well, that's gotta be quite close, the Proteus yeah. chased it with three overs to spare thanks to Captain Cronch 61. They won their first ever ICC trophy. For South Africa have won the World's International Cup in great style. Sadly, it would also be their last. Perhaps the best chance they had to win a trophy was the following year in the 1999 ODI World Cup. All-rounder superstar Lance Klusner and explosive batsman Herschel Gibbs joined the team in the gap as well and they would become vital additions to the team. So, it was as everybody expected. The 1999 World Cup rolled around and it seemed like a walk in the park for South Africa. They easily progressed to the Super 6 and eventually made it to the semis. However, one moment in the Super 6 cost them the tournament. In a Super 6 match against Australia, Gibbs dropped the catch of the captain Steve Waugh. I believe it, that's unbelievable. It, it was a little lollipop. The Australian would end up scoring 120 runs, meeting the target of 272 and winning the game for the Baggy Greens, allowing them to finish above South Africa. And that's it. Australia have won a vital match. Steve Waugh has played a magnificent innings. How did that affect the semifinals? Believe it or not, the semifinals were tied at 213, and Australia progressed only due to their higher finish in the Super 6 table. And it's all over. Needless to say, the fans were devastated. Lance Klesner was in the form of his life, and if ever there was a player who could win them this trophy, it would have been him, but alas, it was not meant to be. The following years brought even more pain for the fans. The team only made it past the group stages in the ODI World Cup in 2007, 2011, 2015, and 2023, and never made it past the semis. In T20s, they did even worse, only reaching two semis in 2009 and 2014. They never quite found success again in the Champions Trophy either, as they only reached the semis in 2006 and 2013. It's not like the team ever performs poorly or lacks quality either. Every tournament they come with a strong squad and do well in almost every match, but they choke in do or die matches. For some odd reason, the South African players just don't know how to deal with match day pressure. It's almost as if Lady Fate is against this team. That said, this curse is bound to end sometime. New Zealand just broke theirs with the 2021 World Test Championship, so there's no reason why the Proteus can't do the same. The fans just need to stick by their players and give all the love and support they need.